The following presentation is not suitable for young children. Listener discretion is advised. On a hot and sweaty Friday morning in June of 1983, Chen Shui walked into work at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in the Upper East Side of New York. He was the system's administrator, so he managed all of the state-of-the-art facilities computers. But as he sat down at his desk in the machine room in the hospital's basement, he noticed something strange. The crown jewel of the hospital, the digital VAX 11780 computer that monitored radiation treatments for more than 250 patients, was quiet. Eerily quiet. It was a top-of-the-line computer, more than five feet tall, connected via telephone lines to a network of machines around the world. It was the hospital's pride and joy and helped cement Sloan Kettering's place as one of the leading hospitals in the country. Chen had gotten used to its steady hum of white noise, but this morning, it was dead quiet. Shit. The VAX mainframe computer that maintained all the hospital records, from patient lists to insurance information, had lost power. This was bad. It cost over $100,000 to buy a new one. What would it cost to replace? With a quick prayer, he restarted the machine and it started back up. It had just turned off during the night, no big deal. But just to be safe, he pulled up the night's logs to see what had happened. Maybe there was a power failure. He scanned the logs, nothing crazy, just routine logs, nothing outrageous. Until he noticed a file with $1,500 in billing logs was missing. And somehow during the night, five new admin level accounts had been created. Somehow, someone had gotten access to their machine and found someone's password to break in. Security set up cameras around the mainframe. They'd catch whoever did it. Then, just to be safe, Chen deleted the new accounts and changed everyone's passwords. Even if somehow someone had got past the security cameras, they wouldn't be able to log in. A few days later on Monday morning, Chen came back in to check the security cameras and no one had come in. The Vax machine was humming along like everything was safe. Just for the hell of it though, he decided to check the logs, and what he saw made his stomach drop. Despite everything, there was a new entry in the log that he couldn't explain. Someone had connected through the telephone system and logged in. And even worse, they'd installed a program that recorded users' new passwords. As long as the Vax computer was hooked up to the telephone system, it was vulnerable. Chen stared back at the logs in shock. Then, with trembling hands, he reached for the phone, and then he stopped. Maybe someone was listening in. He pushed back his chair and ran to the hospital administrator's office. He'd tell his boss in person. Later that week, in the FBI field office in Manhattan, an agent calmly listened to Chen's story of the remote break-in. They wrote down notes and asked probing questions about the computer's modem. Chen wasn't sure if they believed him. As they ushered him out of the office, Chen stopped and looked them in the eye. I swear, it's happening. The agent nodded and said, What if I told you I heard the same story from someone at Los Alamos? Los Alamos? Like the nuclear facility? Someone was hijacking computers all over the country, and the FBI was powerless to stop them. On this episode, Pac-Man, Nuclear Codes, and a real-life war games. I'm Keith Korneluk, and you're listening to Modem Mischief. You're listening to Modem Mischief. In this series, we explore the darkest reaches of the internet. We'll take you into the minds of the world's most notorious hackers and the lives affected by them. This is the story of the 414s. Picture this. It's the early 1980s. In a suburban house, a fresh-faced teenage boy named David Lightman is about to make a huge mistake. He's a smart kid, but he spends more time at the arcade and trying to impress girls than his homework. He wishes he could just play video games at the arcade, but instead, he's stuck at home. His family just got one of those new personal computers, or PCs, and he wants to see what he can do with it. So first, David uses the computer to go check out his high school's grading system, where he finds out that there's no real security protecting their records. He can instantly turn his mediocre grades into A's. 
Then David starts looking for what else he can do. He finds a secretive server and guesses a password. Somehow, he's right. And inside, there's a gold mine. The computer at the center asks if he wants to play a game. But little does David know that this server is really a supercomputer connected to America's nuclear stockpile. And this game is the beginning of nuclear war. All of a sudden, this teen boy is on the verge of starting World War III. Yep, you probably guessed it. That's the plot of the 1983 movie War Games. And that fresh-faced teenage hacker David Lightman was played by Matthew Broderick. It's just escapist Hollywood bullshit right? Well, realistic or not, when it was released into theaters on June 3, 1983, it became a bona fide hit. War Games made nearly $7 million in its first weekend, which in that crowded summer made it number three for the week, just behind those little art house movies called Return of the Jedi and Steven Spielberg's E.T. But then it stayed in the top 10 all summer long, then all the way into the fall. It was a smashing success. After 30 weeks in theaters, it made just under $80 million in 1983 dollars. Everyone in America was watching war games and talking about teenage hackers. But it was just a Hollywood fantasy. Matthew Broderick got the girl, saved the world, and audiences got a nice little vicarious thrill. Anyone serious-minded knew that teenagers weren't about to start hacking into the nuclear arsenal. Some teenagers, who weren't so serious-minded, sat in that theater. And they probably laughed a little. Ha, huh, that's so unrealistic. One teenage boy in glasses whispered to another, Yeah, when we broke into nuclear facilities, it was way easier. The other threw popcorn at him and laughed. Ah, shut up, man, we're gonna get in trouble. They laughed, but they weren't joking. Six fresh-faced Wisconsin teenagers took their new PCs, and, looking for video games too, broke into the nuclear facility of Los Alamos for real. Just like war games, these teenagers stumbled into things they shouldn't have. But there weren't any talking computers for them. Instead, they found the FBI and participated in a cat-and-mouse chase that would change hacking in America. Let's take it back a few years to 1975. Tim Winslow was 13 when he saw his first computer in class at Christopher Latham Scholl's Middle School in the south side of Milwaukee. His teacher invited a computer operator to come to class who brought along a portable terminal from Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC, the same people who'd make Chen Chui's Vax computer eight years later. 13-year-old Tim stared at the machine. It almost looked like a typewriter with legs on it. He didn't know why, but he wanted to use it. The operator asked if anyone wanted to try it, and everyone's hand shot up, none higher than Winslow. But he was in the back of the class, and they ran out of time before they could get to him. As the students ran out, Tim stopped by the terminal, almost drawn to it. He nervously asked his teacher if he could stay late and use it. His teacher smiled at the operator and said sure. The operator dialed into a nearby mainframe and showed Tim a math program. It would be one of the most important moments in Tim's life. Being on a computer was the first time he felt like he had some agency in his life. No more parents telling him what to do. No more graffiti-covered streets he'd have to bike through to get home. If he could figure out the codes, he could do anything, if only on a computer. But being a computer lover in 1975 was immeasurably harder than it is today. You see, back in the late 70s, computers were still, by and large, mainframes, or big machines that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and were only owned by big organizations like hospitals, banks, and universities. Without a computer, Tim instead read everything he could, and at age 17, he convinced the local Boy Scouts to sponsor a club where he and other teams would go to a gray boxy building by the harbor every other Tuesday night to use the machines at Milwaukee's IBM headquarters. Over the next three years, he practiced programming, learned about advances in computing power, and probably most importantly, met other kids his age who cared about computers. Kids like Gerald Wundra, a year older than him, the son of an electrical engineer. The special thing about Gerald, or rather his dad, is that he was one of the first people in the Milwaukee area to have an Apple II computer at home. 
The early 1980s were a revolutionary time in the history of computers. The Apple II was one of the first successful personal computers, or PCs, that weren't just those massive mainframes like the Vax that Sloan Kettering had. Instead, it was possible, if unlikely, to actually own a computer. By the end of the decade, computers could be nearly everywhere. But for the early 80s in Milwaukee, having that Apple II was a very big deal. Gerald and Tim started spending their nights hanging out and using the computer as much as they could. Soon, Tim and Gerald would be joined by Neil Patrick, not the actor, just 16 in 1983 and a student at nearby Rufus King High School. They were soon joined by John Sauls, 15-year-old Paul Sunquist, and one other boy from the computer club whose name still hasn't been released. They were all young. The youngest was 15 and the oldest, 22. All boys, all white, all fascinated with computers. It was fun to finally have friends and to finally fit in, if only with each other. Sure, they knew they were nerdy at a time before it was cool to be nerds, but hey, at least they had each other. They were learning about computers, but also just trying to show off for each other. And if their parents thought it was a little strange, well, it was in the early 80s. Better they're playing with computers than getting into real trouble. Say no to drugs and say yes to life. In time, each of them would get computers at home, either from cajoling their parents or saving up money from odd jobs. But they kept hanging out because they'd found a connection with each other. Soon, though, they got bored with their parents' games, and they started looking around for something more. Neil didn't remember who it was that first tried it, but in 1982, one of the kids showed off a cool new trick they'd found using their modem. Hey, did you know you could dial into a random computer with your modem? The other kids didn't quite buy it at first, so he had them all come over to his house one day after school. They all took off their shoes, said hi to his mom, and got some snacks. When everything was ready, he smiled and showed it off. This was still years before the World Wide Web was invented, mind you. The internet of the early 80s was a primitive place. Most computers connected to each other using a system called Telnet, closely linked to the phone line. And there weren't that many computers on Telnet, so it was really easy to find any random computer. It was sort of like dialing phone numbers in movies from the 1930s. Operator, get me Michigan 340. Neil explained it like this. Well, the way it worked, you contacted a computer by putting in the area code it was located in, then a number indicating which computer it was in the system. So to go to New York, you put in the area code 212, then say 23. If that didn't work, you try 21224. It was as simple as that. So whoever figured it out first, he showed the rest of the guys. He dialed a random area code, then put in a computer's number. The modem dialed and their jaws dropped. On his computer screen, a prompt from a strange computer showed up. He could log into some random computer a thousand miles away. The kids were all impressed. Too bad they couldn't log in, though. But what were the odds that they could figure out a way in? Not so fast. Tim went to one of the books he'd carried around for years. He recognized the login screen. That was from a DEC computer. He had the manual for DECs. Try using the default login. Just like the Wi-Fi networks you see that still have the default names attached, DEC computers had default usernames that someone would have to change. This was in 1982, and not a lot of people thought about that step. Tim typed in a default username, and they logged in. The teens giggled, excited, surprised, and not sure what to think. They had logged on to a random computer half the country away. Hey, what are you doing with that telephone? A parent roared, and the teens had to pack it up for the day. Tim biked home. He took the normal shortcut under a bridge covered in gang signs, all named after the streets the gangs came from, like the two sevens who ran 27th Street, or the one nines who ran 19th. But he didn't pay that much attention. He was too busy thinking about what he'd seen. Later that night on their BBS, one of them typed out a message. I just logged on to another computer. No way. Pandora's box had opened up. Each of these six teens had computers at home. They knew it was possible. There was no way they wouldn't start testing some boundaries. 
That first night, each of them tried dialing different numbers and trying different machines. Most of the times, they didn't get into anything good, but they dialed into Los Angeles 310, New York 212, and Chicago 312. By the end of the night, as the sun was just starting to rise, the teens had had more fun than they'd had in years. And more than that, they felt powerful. They'd been able to get inside the records of banks, universities, and companies all over. They saw personal files from therapist's office and early news from a nearby newspaper. They weren't trying to get rich, they just wanted success. There's no way they could stop doing this. They promised they'd keep going. No computer was safe from them. We're kind of like a gang. Tim said, remembering the gang signs he'd seen earlier. Yeah, but what do we call ourselves? Looking at the string of area codes, it was obvious. Their turf wasn't just some street. They owned the telephone lines. We're the 414s. This is the story of the 414s, a group of teenagers who hacked into the most protected corners of the nascent internet. These six kids would change the way the internet worked and start a nationwide manhunt, all because they wanted to make their mark on the world. For being one of the earliest and most notorious hacking groups of all time, the 414s were also some of the most wholesome. Tim Winslow, Neil Patrick, Gerald Wandra, and three others would meet after Boy Scout meetings on Tuesday nights. They'd sit in a parking lot eating club sandwiches and waiting for their parents to pick them up and they'd talk in low tones about the hacks they were doing. They were like a Wisconsin nice version of what hackers could be. But they'd figured out a back door into most computers hooked up to telephone lines, which, even in the early 80s, meant they had access to some of the least understood underbelly of the American economy, from big companies to universities, and no one knew about it. Over the course of the next few months, they'd pick area codes and dial, trying to find all the computers they could get into. Then, once they found a machine, they'd experiment finding ways in. They didn't have any sophisticated password breakers like you see in the movies because they didn't need them. No one in 1982 was worried about security online. Tim Winslow, 20, had set up a private 414's bulletin board system for them that he just called 414 Private. In this early forum, anyone who found a computer that worked would log the address. Then, anyone who found passwords would save them on the board. It was incredibly incriminating. But then again, look at how weak most computer security systems were. What was the risk to them? They were just kids playing around, and it's not like anyone knew they were doing this. But they were also teen boys, so it wasn't enough just to break into systems. They also wanted to get something out of it. Getting new games was hard in Milwaukee, but online, maybe. The holy grail would be if they could find a video game company's computer so they could download and share a new game release. They'd frantically dial Silicon Valley's area code, 650, followed by computer numbers. But they didn't get a lot of traction. Too many game companies knew to secure their computers and change the default passwords. But luckily, IT departments and big institutions of the early 80s were made up of guys not much older than the 414s who also loved playing games. So more than one big computer hooked up to a big corporation had some games on it that the IT department would play when they didn't have any work to do. So the 414s would break in and search the files. And if they were lucky, they'd find a game. If anyone found one, they'd post a message on the BBS with something like, Hey guys, found an unlocked Sword Quest Earthworld at 51723. They'd play until they got bored and move on. But just like any other good gang, they'd leave their tag. So the next time an IT person played a game, they might wonder who that top score was that called themselves 414. And when the 414s couldn't find any games on a system, they'd make their own fun. One weekend, Neil got the guys together to pull a prank. They all logged in using a default username to a mainframe that was hooked up to a massive printer system. Maybe in a library, maybe in a university. It could be hard sometimes to tell what the computer they were in did. But whatever it was, it had printers that could print thousands of pages. 
Laughing, the teens ordered the machine to print everything. One, two, three, the pages started to fly. The boys couldn't see what they'd done, but they were laughing and they emptied the printer trays, just printing blank pages to fill the room. They timed it so no one would be in the office when it happened. No one would notice until they came in on Monday when they'd find reams of papers everywhere and wonder what in the Sam hell happened. It wasn't enough to just play some IT guys games and play some light pranks on people they couldn't see. They were competitive. They wanted to see how far they could take it. As 1983 started, the group got more adventurous. They wanted to try to find more exciting targets than just cement companies and libraries. Tim was on another bulletin board system for hackers like Plovernet and P80 and, like any other teenager, wanted to be able to brag. To really make a name for themselves, the 414s would break into something big and famous. But it was hard. A lot of the exciting targets were places in New York, area code 212 or 917, or San Francisco, area code 415, and those could have hundreds or thousands of computers hooked up. Finding a specific computer was like hunting for a needle in a haystack. One of them realized that there was one high-profile target that would make the 414s famous, and it wasn't hiding in the maze of a busy city. Los Alamos, New Mexico is out in the high desert of northern New Mexico. It was one of the most remote parts of the continental United States during the 1940s, which made it the perfect place for the Manhattan Project the group that invented the atomic bomb. The lab in New Mexico, the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, was one of the most secure and protected places in North America. The secrets were so dangerous, the American government would kill to protect it. And the government liked that the lab was in the middle of nowhere because it made it harder for people to break in. But being out in the middle of nowhere made it a lot easier for the 414s. Remember how I said they found computers by dialing an area code, then following it up with a computer number? Whereas finding anything specific in a place like Los Angeles with thousands of computers could be almost impossible, in Los Alamos, area code 505, there really weren't that many computers. If you found one, there was a decent chance that it was connected to the nuclear lab. It was a little like war games, except they really wanted to break in. It wasn't just a coincidence. So Gerald, Tim, Neil, and the rest dialed 505, then tried a computer code. 5051, nothing. 5052, no default password. 5053, it's the Albuquerque Hospital. 5054, ooh, look at this. Oh shit. The boys gathered around the computer. Oh shit was right. Neil had tried using the default username and password and gotten on one computer. And the name that blinked at the top? Los Alamos Science Lab. But also unlike war games, and luckily for us, they couldn't start any simulated war games or find any nuclear secrets on there. All they really wanted to do was get inside. And they found something inside this unsecured computer, humming inside the facility that invented the nuclear bomb, that they probably cared about a lot more. A game. So, they all took turns playing a game inside a machine in Los Alamos. And as a badge of pride, they made sure to beat the high score. And when they made their high score, they tagged their name, 414. And the 414s had made it. They were a real hacking group. As the summer approached, they were flying high. Maybe their parents weren't thrilled about the phone bills, but it seemed harmless enough. And maybe one of them could get a job in computers. The movie War Games was coming out, and Neil made excited plans to go see it with the rest of the boys. They watched the trailer and felt seen. That spring, one of them broke into a Canadian cement company and installed a backdoor login that used some of the names from War Games. Another programmed a system to type, Would you like to play a nice game of chess, Dr. Falcon? Anytime someone tried to play a game, they felt cool, a little cocky. They'd been doing this for a year and they hadn't heard a peep from anyone. So the night before War Games came out, the boys got together for a celebratory dialing session. Where do you want to go tonight? One typed enjoying the roleplay. How about the Big Apple? Another responded. 
maybe catch a show or 212. Another laughed, and then they were off. Each of them fired off 212 followed by computer numbers. Soon, Tim found a new computer. It was a big, state-of-the-art DEC Digital Vax 11780. Vax? What's the password for those ones again? It was almost too easy. Tim didn't even have to check his big book of computer manuals. Try username test and password test. Tim logged in using a test account that gave him vast access to the whole machine. He quickly went and set up an account, then ran the command set process priv equals all. Now they could do whatever they wanted on the machine. The 414 spent the next few hours exploring. It didn't seem that exciting, really. It was just a hospital mainframe. There were a lot of bills. Even in 1983, insurance was big business. And patient records. But nothing that fun. Not even a game to play. Just as they were closing out, Gerald noticed something. Uh, guys, I think we might have a problem. There was an automatic logging file that had tracked everything they'd done while in there. No big deal, Tim soothingly said. They just had to delete the file and they'd be fine. Who would check? Anyway, it was like 3 a.m. in New York. No one would notice missing entries. Gerald went to delete the file. Oh, shit. They'd accidentally erased a bill, too. Eh, no one's going to notice it. Come on, it's boring. Let's get out of here. But as they closed it down, Tim thought they might have made a mistake. He'd have to check on it later. The next morning, on June 3, 1983, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center system manager Chen Shui would come into work and discover what the 414s had done. While the 414s were at the movie theater enjoying war games, the movie version of their lives, Chen would be calling security and trying to lock down the hospital. They didn't know it yet, but June 3rd would be the 414's last day of freedom. On Friday, June 3rd, 1983, the teen hacker group, the 414s, broke into the computer system at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and left a trail that the system's manager, Chen Shui, could find. He locked down the system and deleted all the new usernames. But that weekend, the 414s logged back in and saw what he'd done. He hadn't found out how they'd gotten in so they could still use the test username and password, but it was still distressing. One of them had built a key tracker program, so they installed it on the machine. Now, anytime anyone entered a username or password, it would be sent back to the 414s. So it didn't matter what the new passwords people chose, the 414s would always know it. The teen boy, maybe it was Tim, Neil, John, or Gerald, we don't really know, put a little note about it on their private bulletin board system and moved on. It's not like there was anything interesting on the hospital's computer, but now they had access. It was another notch in the 414's belt. And who knows, the 414's had a bunch of computers like that. And usually one of the boys would check in on them every couple of weeks just to see if anything interesting had happened. That Monday, June 6th, Chen figured out they'd broken in through the telephone modem and somehow found a back door in. He told his bosses, and they started the process of reporting it to the FBI. But for now, Chen had a big problem. How was he going to protect the computer? The 414s had already accidentally destroyed a bill for $1,500 that the hospital couldn't recreate. Not exactly a big deal yet, but it felt like an invasion. They'd broken in to his computer. Chen became obsessed with watching the logs, waiting, almost hoping he'd see something. And it didn't happen immediately, but a few days later, he saw a suspicious login. This was his chance. He almost didn't believe it when he saw this. It was real. There was someone actually there. Carefully, he started moving files around. The user seemed to notice and went still. Almost like a big cat prowling for prey that knows there's someone there. Chen made a move, and just like that, the kid logged off. Shit. He lost his chance. He didn't know who this was, but he knew it was bad. But they'd come back, which means they'd probably come back again. So Chen wrote out a text file and left it on the terminal. The first thing someone would see if they logged in with a compromised account? You've done harm to the system. Please call us and help us repair the damage. Chen moved the file in and waited. A little later, there was another login. 
Shen stared at the access logs, afraid to move. The user opened up his text file and read it. Then he logged off. Shit. Chen called the FBI. They said they'd need to talk to the New York phone company and install a tracer. Before they could, though, his phone rang. Hello? On the other end of the phone, a primitive text-to-speech played. We're sorry, we didn't mean to do anything. How did you get in? Chen demanded, his voice raising. Back in Milwaukee, Neil hung up the phone, terrified. Sweat dripped down his face. He was only 17. He was a 3.7 GPA student. He'd never even gotten in trouble before. Oh, please don't tell my dad, he thought. That night at the Boy Scouts Explorer Club, he couldn't focus, and all the other 414s kept staring at him trying to figure out what was wrong. Finally, over club sandwiches, he told them what happened. Why did you call? One of them asked, angry, his voice cracking. But then Gerald reached out his arms soothingly. We're fine. Don't be a baby. That night, the 414s strategized. They wouldn't do anything stupid, but they'd keep checking on that computer just in case something happened. Meanwhile, at Sloan, Chen and the FBI tried to get a handle on who this could be, and they realized pretty fast that these hackers were checking the machine but not staying for long. They needed to find some way they could keep the hackers coming back to the machine long enough for a telephone tracer to work. It was the FBI who came up with what turned out to be a foolproof way to do it by giving the 414s exactly what they wanted. In early July, the FBI installed a Star Trek game on the Vax. The players would go from sector to sector, trying to blow up as many Klingons as possible. It was a game. It was about something these kids cared about. Star Trek II Wrath of Khan had come out the year before and was a very big deal. And best of all, it had a leaderboard. Gerald was the first one to see the game. Guys, big discovery on the 212 hospital. He typed in the BBS. He wasn't even suspicious. A lot of computers had games installed, and they'd been careful after Neil's encounter with them. Probably the IT guy just needed to blow off some steam. At Sloan, the FBI watched in delight as the user login started to swarm in. All the guys wanted a chance to play. And after a few hours of playing, Tim was able to hit the top high score. Not knowing the FBI was watching over Chen's shoulders, he triumphantly typed in the tag 414. With a flourish, he logged out, happy he conquered the machine too. The gang signs near his house were only within a few blocks. His signs made it all the way across the country. But at FBI headquarters, this was the big break they needed. 414. What does that mean? The phone company's tracer helped out. The logins had been coming from Milwaukee, area code 414. Now, remember how there weren't that many PCs out there? And then it was easier for the 414s to find computers like Los Alamos in less populated area codes? Milwaukee wasn't exactly New Mexico, but it also wasn't New York. And it didn't take long for the FBI to track down their guys. The first sign that Tim had that there was trouble was one afternoon late July when his neighbor stopped being friendly, which in suburban Wisconsin is a really big deal. He'd known his neighbor for years. The guy worked at the phone company would always smile, but this morning he avoided Tim and practically ran to his car. Tim went upstairs, a little thrown off, though he wouldn't admit it. Then he got into his computer, and there was another strange thing. His phone wasn't staying hooked up the way it usually did. And when he listened to the modem connecting, it sounded kind of funny. He tried to log into the BBS, and there were all these weird artifacts on the screen like there was some kind of interference. He couldn't figure out what was going on. It was only later when he realized that his neighbor was ignoring him because the neighbor was the guy who installed a wiretap on his phone. Tim had stayed up late trying to get his system working before passing out at 5 a.m. But around 9 a.m., his mom woke him up. The FBI had come to see him. We'd like to talk to you about what you've been doing with that computer of yours for the last few months. Across town, Neil woke up. He was exhausted. He'd been up late online. But his little sister Christine was on his bed. Hey, um, there's some guys here to see you? Bleary, he stumbled downstairs, still wearing shorts and a Mickey Mouse t-shirt. He wiped the crud from his eyes and did a double take. It was two men in dark suits and ties and white shirts. 
They weren't Mormons, he remembers thinking. They laid it out. They knew everything. There was no use lying. His dad came in and called a lawyer. The 414s were in really big trouble. The 414 group of Milwaukee teen hackers were caught and arrested over the course of July and August 1983, while War Games was still in movie theaters. But now that they were caught, what would the FBI do with them? They were just kids, and they weren't trying to do anything truly malicious. None of them had stolen any government secrets or even endangered anyone. The FBI barely understood what they even did. When they came to Gerald's house, they confiscated his computer. But this was 1983, and the FBI wasn't exactly full of people who knew how to use PCs. They couldn't even turn it on. One of them ran to a nearby store to buy an instruction manual, but still couldn't figure it out. They ended up putting his computer in a closet and not touching it for the rest of the investigation. And luckily, or unluckily for the 414s, the whole justice system was just like that. No one knew what to do with them. Computer hacking was barely even a phrase yet. So how does the government charge someone for this? Neil was only 17, and his dad's lawyer negotiated immunity for him. But Tim, Gerald, and the rest were charged with the closest crime that fit the bill, making harassing phone calls. After a back and forth, the defendants all took plea deals and served two years probation and paid $500 in fines. None of them were allowed to own modems during their probation. And while the legal-aged 414s were in court proceedings, Neil took to the talk shows. He became the face of hacking, appearing on the cover of Newsweek and showing up on Crossfire, Donahue, and The Tonight Show. Neil was young, good-looking, and charming. When Donahue asked him when he knew what he was doing was wrong, he grinned and said, When the FBI showed up at my door... He even spoke to U.S. Congress, invited by Representative Dan Glickman on September 26, 1983. On the stand, he pointed out that the only reason they could get into so many systems was that they were so laughably unprotected. He made a splash. And the next year, six bills to regulate computer hacking were passed. All of them are still in effect today. Over the years, Tim started working as a network engineer. Gerald still tinkers with computers, and Neil works in marketing. They didn't know it at the time, but they ended up changing the face of computers in the country. They exposed vulnerabilities that could have been used by rival powers or malicious agents. But they were just looking to leave their high score on the world. I'm Keith Corneluck, and you're listening to Modem Mischief. Thanks for listening to Modem Mischief. Don't forget to hit that subscribe or follow button in your favorite podcast app right now so you don't miss an episode. This show is an independent production and is wholly supported by you, our listeners. And the best way to support the show is to share it. Tell your friends, your enemies, tattoo the show on your chest and go streaking. And another way to support us is on Patreon. For as little as five bucks a month, you'll receive an ad-free version of the show plus monthly bonus episodes exclusive to subscribers. Moda Mischief is brought to you by Mad Dragon Productions and is created, produced, and hosted by me, Keith Corneluck. This episode is written and researched by David Burgess, edited, mixed, and mastered by Greg Bernhard, a.k.a. WeHo's Most Eligible Bachelor. The theme song You Are Digital is composed by Computer Bandit. Sources for this episode are available on our website at modemmischief.com. And don't forget to follow us on social media at Modem Mischief and slide into our DMs. Thanks for listening.